בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back here on a Wednesday night. Stump the rabbi, we're after some divrei Torah. You guys, with the Shem, will ask some questions, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with the Shem, will give us the answers. Tonight's shiur is going to be for the Refua Shlema, for uh, Rabbi Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara bat Anat, uh, Rabbanit uh, Levana bat Sara, Sara bat Levana, Talia bat Sara, Avi Mori David ben Nesriya, אימי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה, רחל בת ז'ורה, and also for the הצלחה רבה and זיווג הגון for the גאון and צדיק הרב מאיר יעקב בן רחל. הקדוש ברוך הוא יברך אותם בכל מכל כל, חיים ארוכים, שלמים, מלאים תורה, מצוות וגמילות חסדים and all of the donors and the helpers and the team of בעזרת השם We blessed a thousand fold and all the amazing effort that they've done over this past year בעזרת השם as this will be the last shiur of the year for us, Be'ezot Hashem. Uh, af- next week, uh, we're uh, not going to have a shiur on Sunday night, preparing for the, uh, the, big, uh, the big day, the uh, J- Day of Judgment of Rosh Hashanah that's uh, going to begin on uh, Wednesday night. But Be'ezot Hashem, uh, tonight's shiur certainly should uh, be more than sufficient for everybody to have a lot to think about and a lot to act on. Uh, as a result of it, Be'ezot Hashem. Anyone that wants to uh, join us and partner with us in our uh, campaign that we have for the high holidays to uh, help feed over 10,000 people, we are literally a world away uh, from meeting our goals uh, as far as uh, getting your help. We need a lot more donors. We need a lot more generosity. We need a lot more care. So anyone that wants to care, wants to be a partner, And this great mitzvah that's uh, going to be done, because one way or another, we're doing it. Uh, right after this year, we'll be wiring a, a bunch more money than we already have. And uh, Bezot Hashem doing everything we can to have these, uh, uh, these people eat. And uh, we're also ha- going to have three Siyumim events. Uh, one is going to be on Sunday uh, in Tveria. It's going to be at Sunday evening, where they're going to start, I believe, around 5 uh, f- uh, o'clock, 5, 6 o'clock. Uh, then they're going to study... Uh, all the way until, uh, I think, a little bit past midnight, and then they're going to do slichot. So it's going to be a, a pretty long session of studying, very serious, hundreds of people, Baruch Hashem, to bring protection and merit to Am Yisrael before the, uh, the, the Chag. Then we're going to have a second event during the uh, 10 days of Tshuva, the, uh, bet- that's between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So it'll be the following Sunday, also in Tveria. And the third event will be Uh, actually, uh, after uh, Yom Kippur uh, and bef- before Sukkot, that's going to be in Yerushalayim. Three major events to uh, do a uh, Siyum HaShas uh, in a single day and uh, also a uh, food distribution for hundreds of families uh, of widows and orphans and all types of people that are uh, precious neshamot that need our help. So anyone that wants to join us, now is the time to do it. You can go to bhrh.org. or bhyk.org, and you can donate over there. There's uh, some options over there for people that are uh, able and uh, willing to be generous. If you want to be uh, named in uh, one of our books that's coming out uh, this year, Be'ezot Hashem, or this next year, uh, we'll have a page with your name on it, giving you a very big blessing, alongside many other things that uh, you'll get uh, Uh, as well, uh, or uh, you could uh, do some of the other donations that are whatever the amount, but there is multiple options there for anyone that wants to uh, join us. Uh, also, as a reminder for people, it's a good idea to get your friends, family, and anyone that you know uh, that cares about Hashem, cares about Torah, cares about Am Yisrael, also to be become familiar with this uh, campaign because there's simply none other like it. We have dozens of stories that Uh, of miracles that have happened to people that have donated to our organization that we've published. There are more and more coming every day. We just don't have enough time to uh, publish all of them. But Baruch Hashem, there's a few more that came yesterday, a few more that came today. We're doing our best to publish them each day. Uh, but uh, the, the stories are amazing uh, and literally just uh, things that uh, you, your, your mind uh, has to catch itself just to understand how many miracles that Kadosh Baruch Hu brought into our hands. Baruch Hashem, specifically for people that made an uh, extra effort in supporting the organization and not just simply a, uh, uh, you know, a, an effort that uh, was uh, easy, just like buying a cup of coffee. Also, you could uh, download our AI Rabbi uh, app. Uh, you could download it for free, test it out for a few questions, and then subscribe 
Uh, it's uh, pretty cheap. It's no no, uh, no different than getting yourself a uh, a coffee and a bagel today. Uh, and uh, you can get yourself a monthly subscription, which certainly is going to help you get endless answers uh, to your uh, Torah questions, ideological questions, uh, with sources and Baruch Hashem in 30 different languages. So with that being said, we have to get started already. Uh, and uh, So this week we have a double parasha. Double parasha means that we have two parashot. Uh, this week that we have to read, uh, this this happens a, a few times a year, where in order to uh, complete the entire Chumash, the entire five books of Moses every year, uh, there are uh, each uh, time we usually read only one parasha, but uh, there's a few times of the year where we're actually reading uh, two parashot. And uh, this is one of those times. In the uh, days of the, uh, 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 of the Gemara, they actually used to complete the Chumash once every three years. Uh, but then when the sages saw that people are forgetting and the uh, degradation of the generations, they decided to change the, uh, the reading to actually read the entire uh, Chumash once every year. Uh, so uh, this double parasha, Baruch Hashem, are the parting words of Moshe Rabbeinu. And uh, we see that there is... Endless rebuke in the entire book of Deuteronomy. Sefer Dvarim is full of rebuke, one after another, one bomb after another, one punch after another. Uh, but yet, when we dig deeper inside the words of rebuke from Akadosh Baruch Hu, from his messenger Moshe Rabenu, we actually see the compassion and the love uh, that, uh, that uh, Moshe Rabenu has for us, that Akadosh Baruch Hu has for us. And in fact, that's what we're going to delve into today, to actually dig deeper inside the words that Moshe Rabbeinu told us before he left this world uh, and find the diamonds in there and realize that uh, what he's actually telling us is that we are much stronger than we think. So Parashat Nitzavim starts off with a reminder to every single generation that this Torah applies to you. It's not just the generation of the desert. It's not the, just the generation that followed it. It's not just the people living in Israel. It's not just the people that live in a religious community. It's not just the people that grew up from. It's not just the people that uh, are uh, aware. It's for everyone. In fact, the Torah says in the beginning of the parasha in chapter 29, verse 11, that Moshe Rabbeinu is telling us, He's bringing this covenant to bring you into the covenant of Hashem your God and into his oath that Hashem your God seals with you. And then later on in verse 13 he says, Not with you alone do I seal this covenant and this oath, but they also include whoever is here standing with us today before Hashem our God and whoever is not here with us today. See here Moshe Rabbeinu, is confirming that this Torah will never change, no matter what philosophers and heretics come out you know, from the woodworks over the years, this same exact Torah stays the same. And furthermore, he gives us the details of those of us that are not glued to Hashem and perhaps think that maybe there's another way, maybe I don't really need to care so much like the rabbi is saying, maybe I could just be a nice person, observe the mitzvot that fit within my life, and perhaps that's enough. Or better yet, I'm already keeping mitzvot. I observe Shabbat, I wear modest clothes, I uh, eat kosher, I'm not robbing anyone in business. So, Enough. I don't need to necessarily care so much about the poor Jews in Israel that don't have food for this holiday. I don't need to care so much about the poor Jews all over the world that are not observing Shabbat. Unless they're my cousin or my brother or my mother, then I'll care. But those that are not really related to me, perhaps it's not my business. Maybe I could just live and let live. Maybe it's not really my responsibility to fight God's wars against the heretics. Then Moshe Rabbeinu 
tells us. Perhaps then, there is among you a man or a woman, or a family or a tribe, whose heart turns away today from the fear of Hashem our God, to go and serve the false gods of those nations. Perhaps there is among you a man contemplating sins or malice, and it will be when he hears the words of this oath, he will think in his heart, saying, Peace will be with me when I go as dictated by the sentiment of my heart, so as to add for him the unintentional sins onto the intentional ones. Here Moshe Rabbeinu says perhaps the scariest words in the entire Torah, where a person that simply thinks that they're doing enough and they don't need to care about the rest of Kalal Israel. They don't necessarily need to care about the spiritual poverty, material poverty, or even, quite frankly, they don't even need to care about their own spiritual poverty. They're doing enough. I'll do whatever fits with me in my heart. Moshe Rabbeinu says, in that particular circumstance, where a person says, I'm doing enough and everything will be fine, that alone acquires that person a decree worse than all decrees, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu will punish them by turning all of their unintentional sins that otherwise they would have been punished for, but not as severely. But Hashem now turns all of their unintentional sins into intentional ones, which get the most severe punishment. Why? says the Bure Onkelos and the Nefesh Ager, because this type of unacceptable attitude of peace will be upon me, I'm doing enough, shows that this person's heart is not with Hashem. And therefore, Hashem will punish them because he intends to follow the dictates of his heart both his intentional and his unintentional sins are committed with the same disregard for Hashem's will. Meaning that since he disregards Hashem's will, then he doesn't get the special privilege of Hashem actually judging him differently based on different things. Because he doesn't care about any of the decrees. He doesn't care about any of the mitzvot. He just cares about whatever is in his own heart. She just cares about whatever she thinks is good. She thinks it's much more important for her to get an extension to our house or a more, uh, you know, more uh, fancy kitchen than perhaps to publicize Torah, perhaps to help Am Yisrael do tshuva. It's much more important to take 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 thousand dollars and get ourselves a nice vacation or a, uh, you know, a more beautiful chandelier or a nicer jewelry that to help Am Yisrael. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you have that kind of an attitude where your jewelry is more expensive than your donations, your car is more important to you than your fellow Jew, then what ends up happening is you're saying that you're doing enough. And by saying that you're doing enough means that you actually don't really care about Hashem's honor, you don't care about Torah, you don't care about anything. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, then I don't care about you. I don't care about how I'm going to judge you. I'm going to judge everything the same thing because you judge all my mitzvot as if it's nothing. And Moshe Rabbeinu continues by saying, Hashem will not be willing to pardon him. For then Hashem's anger and his wrath will be intense against that man. And all the curses that are written in this book will adhere to him. And Hashem will erase his name from under the heavens. Hashem will set him aside for evil from among all the tribes of Israel, like all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the Torah. And the later generations will say, your children who will arise after you and the members of the other nations who will come from a distant land who did not hear about this covenant, when they see the blows of the land and the illnesses with which Hashem has afflicted it, 
He's comparing it to Sodom and Gomorrah. All the nations will say, for what reason did Hashem do this to the land? What is the reason for the intensity of this great anger? And they will say, meaning even the Goim will know this, after they see how much Hashem beat us up if we have such an unacceptable attitude. Ah, it's because they forsook the covenant of Hashem, the God of their forefathers, that He sealed with them when He took them out of the land of Egypt. Now, here we have to understand what we're reading. What is this covenant? Is Hashem saying, oh, because you violated one mitzvah of, let's say, not washing your hands before you eat? Or perhaps you violated one mitzvah of, let's say, you didn't pray on time? Or perhaps you didn't do a mitzvah where uh, you had an opportunity to give somebody a ride to shul, but you decided that you're in a hurry, you need to go to work, so let them... Let them uh, find something else is that what he's saying no here Moshe Rabbeinu is telling us that this careless attitude of I'll just do whatever I feel like doing and everything will be fine I'll keep the mitzvot that I can keep that fit my schedule that fit my life I'll give whenever I feel like giving, because I don't really have to. I'll pray when I have time to pray. I'll do whatever I want. God loves me anyway. Everything will be fine. That unacceptable attitude shows a Kadosh Baruch Hu that we really don't understand anything about who's the king. And therefore, the wrath of a Kadosh Baruch Hu is most severe because it takes everything that a person does and puts it in one category. Unacceptable. Now, why is it so unacceptable? We'll get to in a moment. But so far, we're seeing that the words are words of rebuke. Where is the blessing? The Torah continues warning us verse after verse. If you read this, you don't have to be a genius to understand that God means business. In fact, you see what's transpired in the history of Am Yisrael, but you also see what's transpired even in your own personal life. Anytime you've gone through difficulty, you could find that difficulty in the Torah. Especially in the book of Deuteronomy. Especially in these last few parashot. Where Moshe Rabbeinu is warning us before he leaves the world. Now all of the sins that a person does... Chazal called them where he sinned because he had ruach shtut, a spirit of foolishness. And therefore, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, through Moshe Rabbeinu, in chapter 30, verse 6, that after we do tshuva, after we fix ourselves, Hashem, your God, will remove the foolishness of your heart on the foolishness of the heart of your children, enabling it, you to love Hashem your God with all your heart and all your soul so that you live. And then he starts telling us about all the wonderful blessings Hashem wants to give us. Hashem will give you bounty in all the work of your hands, in the child of your womb, in the young of your animals, in the fruit of your land, for good, when Hashem will return to rejoice over you for good, as He rejoiced over your forefathers. So here we see that everything we are about to pray for on Rosh Hashanah, when we ask Hashem to bless us, 
because we want to have kids. To bless us because we want to find a zivug. To bless us because we want to have more money so we could live a more comfortable life. To bless us, to bless us, to bless us. During that section of prayer, everybody's excited. Amen, amen. Even the guy that just showed up five minutes before the end of the holiday. Everybody's, amen, amen. Everybody's excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want that blessing. Yeah, I want that one. I want that one. But if you notice, during the time of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, there are times we have to do vidui. The vidui, where we confess our sins, especially during Yom Kippur, when we talk about before in Neila, where it's the immorality, it's very short, it's very quiet. I made this in, I made this in, this in, oh, this in. You can barely hear the guy. Everybody's quiet. Well, how come you're not excited about confession? of your sins as you are about the blessings because no one wants to talk about the bad things they did but everybody wants not only a shana tova they want a shana tova umetuka a good year that's sweet when it comes to blessings we want no end to the blessings we want sweet blessings we want more kids. We want good marriage. Someone that's not married wants good a, a good wife, good husband. We want parnasa tova, not just to have parnasa, not just to have a way to make a living, but a good living, which respectable and perhaps even extraordinary. A lot of money. We want to be rich. When it comes to the blessings, we do not skip a beat. In our request from Hashem. When it comes to admitting that we've made some mistakes, we're not as enthusiastic. And what's the difference between the two? Says Moshe Rabbeinu. The difference between getting the blessings of the curses is simply following the Torah and not having an unacceptable attitude. What is following the Torah? Is it, is it difficult? Is it far away? Is it something that requires for me to grow up in a religious house, in a religious family, in a religious community? Is it require me to, to know everything? No. Says Moshe Rabbeinu, for this commandment that I command you today, it is not separated from you, meaning beyond you. It's not so distant. It's not in the heavens for you to say, who can ascend to the heavens for us? And take it for us. And let us hear it so that we can perform it. Nor is it across the sea for you to say, Who can cross to the other side of the sea for us? And take it for us. And let us hear it so that we can perform it. Rather, the matter is very near to you. In your mouth and in your heart to perform it. Here Moshe Rabbeinu tells us point blank. Fulfilling the Torah is easy if you want to. If you have the right attitude, the Torah is the easiest thing in the world. Why easiest thing in the world? Where do we see the words easiest thing in the world? It's in your mouth, it's in your heart to perform it. Meaning, you are created to fulfill the Torah. Just like a phone was created to make calls and a car was created to drive and a plane was created to fly or anything else that was created was created for a specific purpose. Therefore, if you use the plane to fly, that's where it's going to perform the best. But if you use the plane to use it as a as a speed for, for, for driving, you're not going to do so well. If you try to fly with your car by driving it off a mountain, it's not going to have a good outcome. It wasn't created for flying. It was created for driving. If you use your phone as a weapon to throw at people, it's not really going to be such a good weapon. Number one, it's going to stop performing as a phone. It's going to break. And number two, you're not going to be able to use it a second time. 
it'll break but if you use it for the intentional purpose for the purpose of it the phone to call the plane to fly the car to drive yeah that's it if you use your time in this world to follow the Torah certainly you will succeed it's just a matter of time and effort but if you have the unacceptable shalom yeli peace will be upon me attitude as i do what my heart sees fit not only will you not find the torah easy but in fact over time you will find it intolerable you will hate it and you'll find yourself violating it left and right And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu continues verse after verse to warn us. What happens if we choose to go against the Torah? If you choose evil, says Moshe Rabbeinu in verse 17, chapter 30, and your heart will turn away from Hashem, and you will not heed His commandments, and you stray, and prostrate yourself to the false gods of the nations and serve them. Then I tell you today that you will surely be lost. You will not have long days upon the land that you cross the Arden to enter there, to take possession of it. I call the heaven and the earth to bear witness against you. I have placed life and death before you, the blessing and the curses, and you shall favor life so that you will live, you and your children, to love Hashem your God, to heed His word, and to draw close to fear Him. For He is your life and the length of your days. To dwell upon the land that Hashem swore to your forefathers, to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, to give them. Here we see Moshe Rabbeinu speaking clearly without any type of sugarcoating whatsoever. The question is, where is the compliment? One of the things that people want more than anything else and it's not even one of the things, it is the one thing that people want more than anything else so long as they're normal, is life. People want to live. So if somebody finds out that they have a disease that's going to lead to their death, there could not be worse news. When they find out that somebody that they care about has a terminal disease, There cannot be worse news. People want life. When a woman finds out that she cannot have a child to celebrate and raise with her husband, she cannot produce life. Sarai Menu taught us this is like death. This is like the news of death. People want life. They want to live. They want their loved ones to live. They want to, their kids to live. They want to bring kids to the world. They want to create life. There's nothing greater than life. Even the people that chased money and wasted their whole life chasing money and honor and, and, and all types of lust, at the end, they're willing to spend all of it just for another day of life if they could. But the Torah tells us Hashem decides on Rosh Hashanah who will live and who will die. Meaning that even if somebody tries to kill themselves they will only succeed if it was already decreed upon them to die. If they didn't kill themselves they would have died anyway just in a different way. 
Just now, they're dying and it's a sin and they'll have to pay an extra punishment for what they did to themselves. They murdered themselves. But at the end of it all, when you sum everything up, what is the number one most important thing for any one person out there? It's life. And every aspect of life, their own life and their loved one's life, producing life, and despite the fact that we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the only one that decides who lives and who dies, and he decides this on Rosh Hashanah, as the Gemara in Masechet Beitzah says this, on page 16, and so does the Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah on page 16. Hashem also told us that there are things that influence His decision. Things that we can do to give us more life. Because when a person is judged in Shemaim to live or to die, Hashem does not only judge that person, but also every single person that will be affected by it. His mother and father, his siblings, his wife, his kids, his friends, his co-workers, employees, long-distant friend that he hasn't spoken to in years, everyone gets judged. Because everyone will be affected by it. And therefore the Chachamim say that one of the greatest things that a person can do is have a very close relationship with a tzaddik because that tzaddik can save his life. Because if, let's say, he has been decreed to die for whatever sin he made or whatever happened that made this pretty much a day that is going to hurt a lot of people. And according to the calculations of heaven, the parents deserve it, the kids deserve it, the spouse deserves it, the business partner deserves it. But yet he has a friend. He hasn't spoken to him in 20 years. And in the last 20 years, that friend has done tshuva. He's watched the Be'ezrat Hashem rabbis teaching Torah. He's done tshuva. He learns Torah. He does mitzvot. He dedicates his life to Torah. And that tzaddik, although he hasn't heard from his friend in 20 years, he has purified himself so much that his judgment is not to deserve to have any harm. And if he hears that his long-lost friend has died, it would cause him sorrow. And for that, the Chachamim say, Hashem will not let him die. That Sadiq can save his life. But how many of us can say that we have a close relationship with someone that's a Sadiq? In fact, how can we know? So there's another way. By the same calculation, we see that when a Kadosh Bahu decides what he's going to decide on Rosh Hashanah, he's going to evaluate the person and everyone around them. And therefore, if a person makes himself a benefactor of the public, meaning more and more people need him. People need him to teach. People need him to give tzedakah. People need him to, uh, to help them in different ways, to give them guidance, to give them a house, to uh, whatever it is. He's a, he's a benefactor of the public. The greater of a benefactor he is to the public, the more the public needs him, the more there's a reason for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to leave him in this world. Because even if none of those people are tzaddikim, the fact is that 
he's still a vessel that Hashem is using in this world to benefit his people, to benefit the world. So if he's responsible for helping a thousand people eat this holiday through his donation, if she's responsible for helping 5,000 people celebrate the holiday this, this year, if they're responsible for thousands of people doing tshuva in the last several months as a result of their donations, as a result of their teachings, as a result of their actions, even if none of the people at Tzadikim yet, there are simply too many people that are relying on them, they're not easily replaceable, if you will. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decrees they're good for the public. The merit, the combined merit of the public will give them life. So here we're starting to understand that saying peace will be upon me as I do whatever my heart sees fit is contrary to being a benefactor of the public. Because if I do whatever I see fit is the attitude of a person, then that means that he doesn't really care about the public. He'll only help when the public can help him. He'll only do if it's profitable for him. It's only self-interest. This is the reason why there are many places that may call themselves holy institutions, but in reality... They don't help anybody but themselves. You see the kids graduating that yeshiva with 50, 60% of them barely even believing in God. You see that people that come to shul with 50, 60, 70% of them not even observing Shabbat. You see people growing in the community comfortable looking more like the goyim than they do like Jews. In fact, emulating the goyim intentionally. You see that there is a lot of buildings with names on them. But God's not in the picture. So while somebody thought, oh yeah, well, there's Torah out there. You're right, there is Torah out there, but not every Torah is for the sake of Hashem. Sometimes Torah is used as an axe to self a self-purpose, selfish. So how does a person turn themselves into a public benefactor? The Midrash Tanhuma in Parashat Shmot. Second section says as follows, and these are the laws, the laws that are being referred to, of what was written about the king, the king who would build the land on these laws, and the man of Tumot will destroy it. The king. The Melech is referring to the king of Torah. As we see from the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 24. Malkash Torah. What about the Truma? We see that the king will build the world based on the laws. So the king built this world based on the laws of the Torah. But what is this Truma that's going to destroy the world? This man of Truma. Truma is an offering that they brought at the Bet HaMikdash. It's a very special, very extraordinary offering that only the Kohanim could take part of. And because only the Kohanim could take part of it, they had to protect it. By covering the Truma, when it wasn't time yet to bring this offering, they didn't want anyone to steal it. They didn't want any kid to make a mistake and think maybe it's okay because he's only a kid, he's only taking a little bite because anyone that's not a Kohen that ate from that Truma, it's a heavenly death penalty. So protect this priceless offering 
they would actually put it in an ugly vessel. So no one would be interested in what's in that vessel. What could possibly be in that vessel? Nothing's, nothing's valuable in that ugly vessel. Meantime, there's the Tumah offering. And therefore, Rabbi Karim, the Midrash is teaching us that if a person makes themselves into the man of Tuma in order to relieve themselves from becoming a benefactor of the public, where this person is precious, he has an abundance of Torah that he can teach. He's extraordinary Torah knowledge that he can help judge in a Bedin. He's wealthy and he can help people go to yeshiva, have money to eat and celebrate the holidays, Shabbat, feed the poor. He has tools, precious tools that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him. But he doesn't want to be this. He doesn't want to be a public benefactor. He wants to be left alone. Ah, they're going to call me every day and invite me everywhere. They're going to ask me questions nonstop. Let somebody else do it. He doesn't want to donate. He wants to get himself a nice vacation, expansion to the house, maybe a second or a third car, redo his garage. Perhaps plant some more trees in the backyard so he can look at every day while he's drinking his coffee in the morning and the aroma of the coffee will be perfect fit for the beauty that's in his garden. She wants to get herself another piece of jewelry to our collection so that way when she walks down the street people will not only see her but perhaps a spark coming out of her different body parts that wear this new jewelry. She doesn't want to use that money to benefit the public. She said, listen, I I benefited the public last month. I gave a little donation. I even told a few other people, it's good for you. But now it's enough, enough. Yeah, but you have more. You have 100,000, 500,000, a million in the bed. You have a lot of money. It's not like you're struggling. Yeah, but I already did. We understand you already did. But Hashem also gave you more than just what you did. Ah, leave me alone. The sages teach us, the person who makes themselves into a tuma in order to relieve themselves from being the benefactor of the public is judged as if they destroyed the entire world. And on them it's written this verse, the man of tuma would be the destroyer of the world. One of the extraordinary examples of this that I learned with Rabbi Ephraim is a story of Rabbi Ase. Rabbi Ase, on his deathbed, was crying hysterical. And his nephew came in and saw the great Rav, the Gdola Do, is crying on his deathbed. And he knew that he's not crying from pain, uh, physical pain. He's not crying because of any other reason other than the fact that he's scared of the judgment in heaven that he's about to face. He's about to meet the Creator. He's about to meet a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And he's scared to death. But he's a tzaddik. He's a gdol So the nephew says, Rebbe, Why are you crying? Is there a Torah that you've learned and haven't taught the public? Meaning, you you kept it only to yourself? No, you taught endless amount of Torah. Look, you're Talmidim all around you. eh? Talmidim all over town. Is there a Dayanut, a judgment, that you said, no, I don't want to do it. Let somebody else do this. Is there such a thing? Did you ignore some judgment? No. Everyone relied on you. 
Is there any chesed that you didn't do? The entire town has survived because of all of the acts of chesed that you've done to feed the poor, to help the orphans and the widows. Everything is functioning as a result of all the work that you've built over these decades. And on top of it all, you had such good midot, such good character traits, that you never asked for any type of recognition or honor, and you ran away from it. And Rabbi Asiya on his deathbed says to his young nephew, he says to him, my son, this is why I cry, this is why I cry. Perhaps I could have judged as a Dayan even more than I did. And therefore I will be judged in heaven for whatever I could have done. Whereas it says, the man of Tuma will destroy it, will destroy the world. Now, the question is, did Rabbi say, that was he judging only once in a blue moon? And therefore he's saying, oh, you know what, I didn't judge enough. So perhaps there was a, b- a bunch of bad judgments out there. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 10, 10a, says that, when Rabbi Ase and Rabbi Ami and Rav Ami, Rav Ase and Rav Ami were studying Torah, these are the two Gdole Adol, top Amoraim of their generation. When they were studying Torah in the Bet Midrash, they would stop every hour and one of them would go to the door, open it where the public is there, all the people that are studying in the Bet Midrash, anyone that came in, that's who everyone was. And they would ask, and they would knock on the table, is there anyone here that needs us to judge a case? Is there anyone here that needs our help? And if no one needed it, they'd go back to studying Torah. How often would they do this? Every one hour. Meaning that there's Certainly no judgment whatsoever that Rabbi Aseh denied or ran away from. But yet Rabbi Aseh knows in his level, in his level of righteousness, in his level of scholarship, in his level of the abilities and the blessings that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him, perhaps it wasn't enough for him to stop learning every hour and ask people, if they need it. Perhaps he should have gone out into the public chasing opportunities to help people. If that's the way they're going to judge me in Shemaim, I'm doomed. Because whatever I did was not enough. He's crying about the risk of maybe he did not do enough. And the Midrash Rabbah in Shmot, Parashat Lamed, says on this verse, the king that will build the land on the laws and the man of Tumot that will destroy it, the king is referring to Yehoshaphat, who said in the book of Chronicles 2, chapter 19, verse 6, where he said to the judges, the judges of that day, look what you're doing. Meaning you're not helping the public enough. And on you it is written that you are men of Truma and you will destroy it because you're too busy to help people. And Hashem says about you, that you're destroying my world. Here we see, Rabotai, that whatever Hashem gifts us with, whether it's extraordinary Torah knowledge, or wealth, or abilities, 
it's not just for our own enjoyment or our own benefit, but rather we are supposed to use whatever we have in order to benefit the public. Now, is benefiting the public easy? Absolutely not. It's the exact opposite. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, one of the greatest sages that ever lived, who went up to Shemaim alive, went into Gan Eden alive. He said, as a result of him doing Kiruv, helping people do Tshuva, teaching Torah, he ended up forgetting 300 alachot, meaning it hurt his own learning. But he continued to do it. Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to select the Sanhedrin of his day, the first Sanhedrin. And he did a goral, a lottery. But there were two names that were selected that were not in the room. His stepbrothers, Eldad and Meidad, were also prophets, but they were very humble and they did not think that they were fit to be at such high positions. Moshe Rabbeinu came to them and said to them, you think that I'm giving you honor? By being leaders of the public, you are servants. There's no honor. Now the problem is, Rabutai, that the average person does not think that this is referring to them. Perhaps they're not a speaker, they're not a rabbi, they're not so knowledgeable, they're not so rich. But these words of the Torah are just like what the parashat said. This is for everyone. Men and women alike, young and old, those of the past generation and those that are listening and reading it today. This applies to all of us. Where a person that desires life more than anything else has to know there is one key to increasing life or ruining life. Where if a person realizes that I could increase life by simply doing more for the public's good, more people doing tshuva, more people learning Torah, more people serving Hashem and therefore more of Hashem's glory. That's the purpose of the world. What do I have that can do that? If you have Torah knowledge, you can teach. If you do not have Torah knowledge, then you have to find another way. What other tool do you have? Well, I have a regular job. What do you do? Well, I'm a pharmacist. I'm a construction uh, worker. I have a little business selling all types of chairs and and boats and, and, and different things. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. Well, guess what? Whatever profession you have produces money. That money is not just for you to eat it. It's it's not just for you to vacation with it. It's not just for you to save it for a retirement that may never happen. But rather for you to use a certain section of it where you are using that to your fullest extent, to become a public benefactor. Now, how much should a person give? Anything less than 10% shows that a person doesn't really believe that Hashem is providing him 100% of his money. Now, is 10% enough? It depends how much a person has. If a person has a lot, 10% is not enough. If a person has very little, then 10% is more than enough. The problem is that a person thinks, well, wait a minute, I'm only making 5,000, 10,000. Even if I give 10%, what can that possibly do? What can that do? What is that going to get? 
a few this, a few that. It can't do that much. If I was rich, if God will give me the lottery and I get $100 million, then I'll do much more. That's the Satan telling you that. Why? Because you now are trying to justify saying, Shalom Eli, meaning peace will be upon me because since I'm not the biggest Torah scholar or I'm not really skilled with, with the ability to speak or uh, you know, I, I'm, I don't have an audience, I don't have subscribers, I don't have a crowd or I don't have any money and I'm not so rich. So you know what? I don't have to do anything. I'll just be fine. I'll just have to take care of myself. I'll get myself my boat. I'll get myself a second car. I'll get myself an extension to the kitchen. Make it bigger than the living room. I'll get myself this. I'll get myself that. And uh, that's enough. Says the Torah Tosha. Yes. You are very special. You are very special. You don't even realize how special you are. You don't even realize how strong you are. You don't realize why. Because you are like a person that's a fireman. And the fireman goes on his job and there's a fire in some building. And he goes into the fire and he saves a baby. And he comes out with the baby. And he was like, yeah, yeah, good job, great, great, wonderful, wow, wow. It's like you were doing the mitzvot. You keep Shabbat, you keep, uh, you know, Tarat Mishpacha, you, you're good. But then, all of a sudden, everyone, their smiles and celebration turn upside down. As they look at this fireman, start to take off his equipment. And sit down, grab a Coke, cold drink, and starts drinking, relaxing. Yeah. Whoa, that was great. What are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? I'm resting. That's it, I'm done. I'm done. What do you mean you're done? I'm done. How can you be done? Look, I saved the baby. Yeah, but there's 12 more babies inside the building. What do you mean you saved the baby? Good you saved the baby. Good you keep Shabbat. Good you gave money last year. Good you did something a long time ago. But there's still 12 more babies in the world in the, in this, inside the building. There's still millions of Jews that are not keeping Torah and mitzvot. One baby is not enough. How can you sit here relaxing well I did I did good things yes but there's still millions of babies that have not returned to their Abba and Shamaim. how can you allow yourself to pause how can you allow yourself to vacation how can you allow yourself to be so nonchalant and careless about everything else in the world because you did something good in the past while there's 12 million Jewish babies that may go into Gehenom because people like you don't care enough about them. How can you do that? And if a person has their eyes in their head, they realize, you know what? If God made me a fireman, that means I need to fight fires. Fight fires. If God made me a good speaker, that means I could publicize his name. If God made me rich, that means I need to use the money to publicize Hashem's name. Even if God did not give me a lot of money, but certainly he gave me more money than what I really need, then I can certainly take whatever I have and use it to make sure that I'm not the man of Tumut that's hiding whatever good is inside just to relieve myself of the responsibility, just to have my own peace and quiet. Because if I do that, even the good that a person does, Hashem Milachem can turn into bad on a day of judgment. When we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu for blessings, we ask Him for abundance. And not just abundance, abundance that's sweet. When we ask Him for health, we ask Him for the best health. 
When we ask him for marriage, we only we ask him for marriage that also produces happiness and children. When we ask Hashem for money, we don't only ask him for money, we ask him for extraordinary success. When we ask a Kadosh Baruch Hu for things, we want the whole the whole pie. When we ask Hashem for life, we ask for a long life. Hashem says, that's all available to you. Give me a reason. The number one reason is if you benefit my nation. If you use what I gave you to benefit my nation beyond the norm, to the highest extent, then I will also change the norm for your sake. And one of the saddest things that you can see, Rabbi Karim, is when people fall for the Satan's trap in thinking that whatever they can give is not enough, so therefore I shouldn't do anything. And unfortunately, not only does not turn them into people that are not using their gift, but it also turns them into ungrateful people where they only benefit from Hashem. They only benefit from the public. They only benefit, but they don't give. They don't contribute. Now I always tell you guys that I don't track donations. I don't have time. There's reporting. We look at the overall numbers each month, but with the exception of people that I'm very close to, I don't usually know who's donating, who's not except if they're a larger donor and I have to pray for them. There's usually more that is required. When they make the large donations, they also have us make a video for them or we pray for them or different things. We usually have a a stronger relationship because these are people that really believe in our work. They believe in what we do. But there are many people that perhaps are not large donors, but they still ask a million questions. Guidance that would cost them tens of thousands of dollars is given to them for free. They ask for marriage, you know, uh, marriage questions, whether it's to find someone to marry or it's to fix their current marriage where their spouse is becoming someone they hate. And they want me to fix it. Or they ask for guidance with their kids because they don't really know what to do with their kids because their kids have certain issues. Or they don't know how to raise their kids and they don't know what books to buy those kids or which school to pick or which teacher to teach, to use as a teacher. Or which show is permissible to watch. Because just because it says the name Torah on it doesn't necessarily mean it's really Torah. There are many Christian missionaries that title their videos also Torah. So they'll ask you questions about books and they'll ask you questions about their children and they'll ask you questions about their marriage and they'll ask you for guidance about what to do with money and whether they should get a different job or whether they should ask for a raise or whether they should sign a contract with a new customer or re-sign something with an old customer or perhaps they should, you know, hire a new lawyer because of this lawsuit that they have or they're suing someone or someone is suing them or someone is throwing them out of a house or they're buying a house and whether they should hire a new company to redo their kitchen or perhaps maybe even a new customer that could become someone that is also a service provider people ask endless amount of questions and we do the best that we can to answer every single one of them We don't always succeed, but we do our best. And those that do get our attention certainly benefit. And if that weren't enough, there's also millions of dollars that we give, not just to the poor people in Israel, but also to the general public with free books and USBs and CDs and posters and magnets and all types of Torah material in English and in Hebrew and in French and in Russian. And of course, the very same people ask for those books 
and they get literally thousands of dollars worth of books every month, every other month, once a year, whatever it is, but they certainly get thousands of dollars, in some cases literally tens of thousands of dollars worth of material that they now have the benefit of distributing to their community to not only benefit from the mitzvah, but also benefit from the recognition. Wow, you really care about the community. You're giving free Torah. And all of this they get for free. They don't even pay for shipping. That's our Torah store, our Kirov store. Now it's wonderful that our organization is built in such a way where we literally believe in Hashem day in, day out, that He will provide. And we know that our breakfast, lunch, and dinner of tomorrow, and the breakfast, lunch, and dinner of tomorrow of the poor people that we help, and the books, and the USBs, and the movies, and the employees, and everything is only provided by Hashem. There is one thing that a person can do to hurt me. And that is to take, 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 but never give back, even when they can. And the reason that hurts, more than anything else, more than the naysayers that insult, more than the heretics that go against, the reason that hurts more than anything is because it makes me question. If you are asking us questions, about such critical issues of your life and your business and, and, and your marriage and, and, and your lawsuits and whatever it is that's happening in your life. You're making critical life decisions based on this advice. You're spending an enormous amount of time watching these lectures. The majority of your understanding of what Hashem wants, you're getting from the lectures. You're watching the videos. You have the app for free. You have the, you get the books. You get everything that is given for free. Why don't you also give? It's either you believe in what we do or you're just simply a leech. And that's the reality where some people simply do not have the merit to give. We know where our breakfast is going to be tomorrow. Hashem's going to provide it. But it hurts. It hurts to actually have some people pretend like they care, pretend like they believe, pretend like they support, but at the end of it all, they don't actually believe in the cause because they're not willing to also give back. They're just willing to take. Oh, it's free books, I'll take it. Oh, it's a free lecture? I'll take it. It's a free video? I'll take it. To free this? I'll take it. They'll take whatever they can. But when it comes to giving, no, no. I'll give locally to my shul. I'll give to uh, some organization that's in my country so I can get the tax benefits. I'll give to the uh, rabbi that uh, calls me every other day and he gives me a lot more attention even though all the real questions I ask you. Or I'll give to this, but even I like this, even though this other organization or this other place doesn't actually give me anything, and I already got five, ten, twenty, thirty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars worth of material from you. I'm still giving it to somewhere else. Why? Because I want to save the uh, the uh, the angry dogs of Alaska. And what ends up happening, Abutai, is a person can be so deluded. And what is the purpose of life that they'll feel like they're doing the right thing by simply being a taker? This is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. In life, if you want to serve Hashem, you have to be a giver. How much to give? As much as you possibly, as much as you possibly can. Because you want Hashem to give as much as He possibly can. And so you don't think that this is a 
some money hungry, uh, looking what it's in your pocket or caring what's in anyone's pocket. This Rabutai is a rebuke from the Chida. The Chida had many books. He was a Gaon, Kadosh, Mekubal. But one of the things that he did was travel from country to country, collecting money for the poor in Israel. And one of the ways that we know about what he endured is he actually had a journal, a Yoman, which they actually publicize as a book. This was his personal journal, and he writes in there what happened to him in different communities. And he says different hardships that he had where one time there was a community that thought that he was a scammer because there was a bunch of scammers that came into town pretending that they're the messengers from Israel. So the community gave them a bunch of money. So then when the Chida came, they thought he's the scammer. And only after he started teaching Torah did people realize this is not only a tzaddik, this is not only not a scammer, this is a gdol adol. But he had extraordinary difficulties. Well, one time he came into a town that was being raided by a bunch of Arab terrorists, the marauders, who came in and murdered, raped, and stole everything in sight. And as he's there, he sees that at the end of the road, 250 of them are coming his way. And he writes, I knew that my life is at risk, and therefore I used one of the holy names, and I turned myself into someone that you cannot see. Where I can see them, but they cannot see me. He became invisible. To understand the level of Kedusha and holiness that he had in his hands, where he could literally make himself disappear, but yet he still had to deal with people that did not recognize their own obligation, their own gift. And when he came to one community in Europe, collecting, he gave a shield Torah about how important it is to give. He gave the gabai, the sack, where the community can put some money in there, where they're not giving to empower and enrich the chida. He's collecting for the poor. And he gives them a shield Torah. And everyone's enamored and everyone likes it. And they know this is a gaon, this is a tzaddik. And people have money. They're not, uh, we're not talking about the poor community. They have enough money to buy a thousand dollar phone. They have enough money to buy a house. They have enough money to buy us two or three cars. They have enough money that they have a job. These are not poor people. Not everyone's rich, but certainly not everyone's poor. And he's speaking to them. And at the end of his speech, they give him the sack. And he sees the sack, and it's light. He opens the sack in front of everyone. He reaches inside, and he sees there's less than a handful of coins in there. And he says to the people, What? This? This is what you give? This is how you care, care less about the poor people of Israel. This is what you think of a Torah. I do not forgive any of you. And he leaves. After he leaves, he gets into the carriage. The horse and carriage was the way of commuting in those days. The Gabay of the Bet Knesset understood that this Keila that benefited from a Chacham, that benefited from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, that they have food to eat beyond what they need, has just made a dear mistake. 
And he immediately appealed to the Keilah to realize that to actually do such a thing could be a dire consequences. When we say peace will be upon us, we're doing enough. Immediately the Keilah started giving and filled up the sack and he, the Gabai went and chased after the carriage of the Chida until he finally reached him. He said, please, please, Kvodarab, we're sorry, we're sorry. Here, here, we're sorry. Please, we do not want the Chacham to be angry on us. And the Chida takes and he sees that the community has donated a substantial amount. He says, don't do that again. Meaning, even though you give, don't think that you could just do whatever you want in this world. Hashem blessed you. You have a responsibility. Do not be the man of Truma that hides the beauty and the gifts that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you just because you want peace upon yourself because you care less about everyone else. To do such a thing has the worst possible consequences. You're in this world because you want life. The way to get life, benefit the public. The greatest way to benefit the public is by getting them closer to Hashem and His Torah. And Be'ezat Hashem, more and more of you will realize your responsibility before the judgment day and take advantage of whatever gifts HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you and use them to benefit the public much more than whatever you've done until now. Even if you've already done well, because even if you saved one baby or two babies, there's still millions more that need to be saved. And if you have the ability to do it and don't do it, you'll be judged for it. And to me, that's a scarier rebuke than even Ganom. Because which one of us could really say, honestly, I'm giving it everything I can. Be'ezat Hashem, we will all do tshuva and give everything we can. With that being said, Rabotai, you guys can ask some questions. Be'ezat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch will give us the answers. As far as the campaign for the high holidays to help the poor, to help us feed over 10,000 Jews, to have these Torah events, to have all the wonderful things, to maybe perhaps have the merit and the blessing to also build the yeshiva that we want to build, you could donate generously on the campaign, the bhrh.org, bhyk.org. You could donate on the regular website that we have, bezadashem.org. And see, see that you are giving as much as you can, especially, especially if you are a major benefactor of all the things that the organization Baruch Hashem has given to you. Do you have questions you have? Okay, so I see that uh, so far YouTube has more foolishness than questions today. So let's go to uh, TikTok. Let's see if you guys have anything good. Uh, please explain why it's impossible for the Torah to have been changed. That's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu promises us in actually in this week's parasha that this Torah is the same Torah that we will always have. So if you believe in God, that means that He is above and beyond nature, He's above and beyond time, He's in control of everything. And if He wants His people to follow His Torah, then He's going to ensure that they have the truth and not some corrupted version like they have in Islam or in Christianity. So the Jewish people have always been the Jewish people. We haven't changed. Our Torah hasn't changed. And Baruch Hashem, Hashem has ensured that that's the case. Now, in addition to that, there are different scientific proofs that show that the Torah could not have been written by men, meaning that if the Torah would have changed and there was man-made manipulation within the Torah, then those scientific uh, uh, experiments 
would not have actually succeeded. You see that in the Torah, there are prophecies that have been fulfilled. And there are promises in the Torah that no human on earth could ever promise. And therefore, if a person watches my film called Torah, Science, and Ancient Wisdom, or some of the other films we did about science, The Signature of God, and uh, some others on the channel, you'll see that it's not just that there is a creator to the world, but that creator has a signature. And that signature is the Torah. And if the signature of the Torah is the signature, if, if the signature of Hashem is the Torah, that means it cannot be changed. all Jews Zionists? No. Zionism is a movement that was started by Jews that were against the Torah and were communists. And uh, they fooled the people to thinking that they're representing Judaism and the Jewish people by calling it Zionism because Zionism, the the word Zion uh, or Zion comes from the Torah. But this was just simply a play on words. Uh, these people that are uh, behind Zionism were some of the biggest enemies of the Jewish people throughout all of history. And I have many lectures where I spoke about the uh, founders of Zionism, the leaders of Zionism, and Zionism at large. I have an entire series called the Era of Mashiach, where uh, we teach, the uh, based on the teachings of the book by Rav Elchanan Vassaman, talks about how the Zionists are literally the biggest enemy that Am Yisrael has ever had. They're part of the Erev Rav. Uh, they're, uh, they're worse than, uh, than uh, missionaries and, uh, and, uh, and the Muslims. Uh, because while the, uh, while the Zionists may be Jewish as far as their, uh, you know, who their mother is, they hate the Torah and they try to destroy it. Uh, they're, spir- they're, they're spiritual enemies of the Jewish people. So, no, most Jewish people are not Zionists. Uh, and in fact, even the people today that claim to be Zionists, but yet religious Jews, many of them do not have the same understanding of what Zionism is as what Zionism really is. Meaning they believe that Zionism is, a, is, is represented by simply loving the land. Well, that would make all Jews Zionist by loving the land, but that's not what Zionism is. Zionism is a anti-Torah movement. It's a communist movement. It's an atheistic movement that uh, simply uh, makes the land more important than God, more important than the people, more important than anything else, which is completely stupid. But nonetheless, that's what Zionism is, and they they do it at all costs. There are uh, there is a, uh, a documented proof that the Zionists even worked with the Nazis. Uh, and had dealings with them. Uh, and in fact, there was one opportunity that uh, they were, the Zionist leaders were able to save one and a half million Jews from the concentration camps towards the end of the Holocaust and uh, in exchange for a bunch of trucks, tea, and coffee. And they chose not to save them because they didn't want those types of Jews to enter the land. So they preferred for them to die. This is not a conspiracy. This is proof uh, in court cases that were in Israel, this was publicized, there's books about it, I've spoken about it in lectures. Uh, so the point is that the Zionists are certainly not friends of the Jews. The problem today is that there's a lot of ignorance. And most people do not know the difference between, you know, appreciating and loving the land uh, and, and even the, uh, the, the people at large versus a ideological belief that is against the people and the land and everything else. 
the uh, the, the, the movement, the, the the whole ideological, uh, um, the whole ideology of Zionism is uh, is something that is not good for anyone, and they're the ones that have caused a lot of problems over the last couple of hundred years. But needless to say, uh, the uh, there are some people out there that have a different definition to it. Uh, and, you know, and, and claim that you could be a Zionist without actually caring about the political agenda of Zionism, uh, yet just simply be a Zionist by the definition of loving the land. And that's simply a, a new form of that Zionism that is not really the real Zionism. So uh, I have many lectures about the topic. You could look into that if you'd like. Does Hashem accept our slichot even if we mess up? If we miss one day or another by accident, sure. Even if you only go one time, Hashem will still accept your slichot. Your slichot is an extra effort by you to get closer to Hashem at this time. The more you do, the better. But uh, if you do less, then certainly Hashem still accepts the rest of what you do. If a person has different skills that can be used to do kirub, should he focus on the, on the one that is more effective and less time-consuming and leave the others behind? Uh, yeah, that would make the most sense. A person needs to do the most that he possibly can with the least amount of time. Now, that does not mean that he shouldn't do anything with the rest of the time. Meaning you have, let's say, 24 hours a day. And... You have a a certain skill that you could use, let's say, for an hour a day, and that could get you the most amount of results, whether it's in Kiruv or it's in business or it's in anything else. You have an hour a day. Now, that's great that that one hour of day uh, produces so much results, but that doesn't mean that you should, you know, simply do nothing for the other 23. You know, the question is, what is the other 23 comprised of? If the other 23... Uh, hours are comprised of necessary things in order to allow you to have that one hour free, then by all means, one hour is the maximum you can do. But if out of the 23 hours that you have left, there's only, let's say, 15 of them uh, that are used for necessary purposes, and uh, the rest is uh, wasted on all types of things that are not necessary, all types of things that perhaps are even not good, uh, then certainly a person needs to do more than one hour. So, but as far as which part to do that's going to be the most effective, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, a person needs to see results. Usually in the beginning, uh, you know, a person is uh, not going to necessarily see as much results as they will in the long run. Uh, because results in the world of, of, of Kiruv take time. Even if you give a lecture and people are impressed by it and they like you, and uh, they even tell you some compliments. That's not necessarily results. That just means that you sparked a uh, you sparked, you know, uh, their heart a little bit, and that's good. But to really help the people, you know, the people have to transform, and that's going to take a lot more than just one lecture. There has to be more lectures. It's just same thing with somebody that gives. If somebody, for example, gives a uh, certain amount of money, and uh, they donate, and that's great. But they shouldn't say, okay, I gave and that's enough. No, if, if there's more that you can give a week from now, a month from now, a few months from now, whenever it is, then you certainly need to do more. Why? Because what you gave in the past was good for the past. But you have to continue giving, you have to continue doing every time there's an opportunity to do, every time there's a calling to do. And every time the person does, uh, they have to exert themselves a little more. A little more than they did in the past. Just like a person that wants to grow in business exerts themselves more and more over time in order to reach higher goals. A person that wants to you know, become more muscular will exert themselves more and more each month because they want to get more muscular and more fit and so on. And a person that uh, wants to do anything in life knows that it's necessary to continue growing and continue exerting yourself more and more. The same thing goes with your efforts in Kiruv. Whatever you're doing has to continue growing. You cannot do the same thing and just be on neutral. You have to keep pushing yourself further and further. And you'll see, the more you push yourself, the more you'll succeed. The more you'll succeed. And the, uh, and the person that succeeds the most are the ones that push themselves the most. You know, when people uh, ask all the time how we do 
all the amazing things that we do, uh, well, simple. We keep pushing ourselves. We push ourselves to the maximum. And whatever success Hashem wants to give us, He gives us. And then the following year, we push ourselves beyond last year's maximum. Why? Because we need to. And each year, Hashem decides what success we have. But the one thing that's within our hands is how much we push ourselves. Last year, the limit was, let's say, 100. So this year, we know that we have to beat our, you know, our, our, our efforts of last year. Results are in the hands of Hashem. But as far as effort, we know that we can reach 100. Therefore, we need to push further. Where can you learn that from? Paro. Paro, before he turned all of Am Yisrael into slaves, he gave them jobs. He told them to leave their businesses. Leave your businesses. Leave your phone company. Leave your, uh, you know, your insurance company. Leave your shop. And come work for the country. Come work for Paro and I'll pay you double what you make in your business. So everybody left their jobs. Everybody closed the shop. And everyone was excited. Not only they're helping the country, but they're also making double what they were making before. If you were making 10000 last month, now you're making 20000 So now they worked with a lot of excitement. And that's when Paro saw how much can they do. Oh, look, this guy, he can do 100 stones a day. This guy can do 98 stones a day. That guy can do 110 a day. So what did Paro do? Little by little, the salary went lower, but he kept promising them that things will change until eventually the salary went to zero and they turned into slaves. But there was one thing. Now that I know that you can produce 100 stones and you can do 90 stones and you can do 110 stones, that is exactly what I expect from you every single day, even though you're slaves now, even though you work for free now. And if you don't, and you actually produce 99 stones instead of 100, then I'll have to replace that one stone that's missing with one of your kids. And therefore, Am Yisrael worked endlessly because they knew that life is on the line. But Paro's strategy is also a Musar to us to learn that we have to look at things from the perspective of what's the maximum we can produce. And usually a person performs the most, the, the best, when they think there's the greatest amount of reward or there's the greatest amount of risk. If your life is on the line, you'll do everything to save your life. You'll even lift the car over your head if you have to. You'll do whatever you can to save your life. The same thing if you know there's a great amount, of, greatest amount of benefit. If somebody told you, work for one hour, but you're at your full potential, and I'll pay you a million dollars. That one hour will be the best one hour of work you've done in your entire life. Why? Because you want that huge amount of reward. So when a person does Kiruv to help publicize God's name, to help publicize the Torah, to help Jewish people get closer to Hashem, to help the world recognize the Creator and realize that helping the Jews get closer to Hashem is for the better good of, of, of the world, not just for the Jewish people. When a person realizes how much is on the line, on the benefit but also on the downside, how much we lose if we don't get Am Yisrael to do tshuva, the whole world gets destroyed, everyone loses as a result, then a person is going to actually do everything they possibly can to reach their peak. And guess what? Since HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to publicize His name, wants us to learn more Torah, wants us to help more Jewish people eat, drink, Get, do tshuva and so on. He's going to help us. As the Gemara in Maseret Moed Katan says, Abali ter biado. Somebody that comes to become purified, meaning somebody that comes to do good, Hashem will help them. And in fact, the uh, Chachamim teach that on the Mishnah in Maseret Avot that says, Schar mitzvah mitzvah, the reward for a mitzvah is a mitzvah, is not telling you that there is no reward there's no, but rather, when you actually do something good, for example, when you donate money to Bezat Hashem, Hashem gives you more money. Why is He should give you more money? The more money that you got, like the nice uh, student that I have that just publicized 
uh, I believe it was yesterday, or today or yesterday, that she donated the most amount she ever uh, had in her life at the time of $650 to do a mitzvah. She donated to our organization. And two weeks later, Hashem gave her 12000 12000 wasn't the reward for the 650 No. But rather, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, the reward for the mitzvah is another mitzvah. And since I saw that you like to give and publicize my Torah, I'm going to give you more to give. Because now that you gave 650 I want you to give more. So what did he give her? He gave her 12000 And that 12000 you give, let's say, 10% of that as Maser. Now you're able to give 1200 That's nearly double what you gave two weeks ago. And the more a person gives, the more blessings they have. And I've seen this with my own eyes, not only in my own life, but also in other people's lives. The problem is that the Yetzirah shows up along the way and convinces the person to start distributing their wealth everywhere and start giving to all types of organizations, all types of places, and before you know it, they lose the blessing. And they don't know why. They think maybe it's bad business, or maybe it's bad luck, and they don't realize it's because the source of their blessing was the first place that gave them the blessing. And when they turned in different directions and they lost the blessing. And that's I've seen this multiple times. I told you guys a story where there was one time a, a person that uh, donated a, uh, a substantial amount of money at the time. I think she donated something like $50,000 or something like that. And literally within a year or a year and a half, her business went from being a few hundred thousand dollars to maybe four or five million dollars. And uh, this was great. Everything was fantastic. But instead of sticking to the plan, she decided to start, you know, becoming a little philanthropist. So she started, you know, she started distributing money all over the place. And what ended up happening? She lost everything. And she had to rebuild. And hopefully, I hope she succeeded. But... It's, a, uh, it's, it's something that I've seen one too many times where people do, the, do what Hashem wants them to do. They get the opportunity to do even more, meaning the money that she got was not a reward. The money that she got was an opportunity to do more in the same place, which was the original plan. But when a person doesn't follow their deal, Hashem cancels the deal. So it's important for a person to know if you donate to our organization, and you don't see a blessing is one of two reasons. One, you're not really giving enough, meaning you're not giving at least 10% of, of, of your income. You're not really giving. You're giving, you know, like the, uh, the change. The change, whatever, you, whatever you, you, you could live without, whatever you don't care about. You know how you give to like homeless people, whatever you don't care about. Or there's something wrong with us. If you're not seeing a blessing, you don't see great things happen in your life as a result of, subst- of giving to our organization, stop giving. Or give more. You know whether you're giving enough or not. Why? Because you do math. Do math. You have $5,000 coming in every month. You give $500 on a regular basis. You should see blessings. Not the next day. Sometimes it's the next day. Sometimes it's a month later. Sometimes it's six months later. But certainly you're going to see blessings in your life. Not just monetary blessings. You'll see other blessings in your life also. If you're not seeing blessings as, give- as a result of giving and pushing yourself over and over again to give more and more and more, there's something wrong. And that's why I always tell people, and I've said this time and time again, people that give to our organization see extraordinary blessings. If you're not seeing the blessings, don't give. Don't donate to us. Go find someone else. And Baruch Hashem, until now, no one has chosen that, uh, that option as a result of not getting a, uh, the blessings. The people that sometimes... Uh, go and donate their uh, money to, to other places also, it's usually because they make the mistake, they think that they could just, now that they have more, they can give to more places, and that's a mistake. That's a mistake. But again, we don't tell people what to do. Everyone has free to do whatever they want with what they want, but don't come to me crying after the blessing is gone. It's not my fault. Yeah, let's see. Hi, Rabbi, can I study with you one-on-one? 
as much as I would love to study with every person out of over 100,000 followers one-on-one, -on -one, I simply cannot afford to study uh, with anyone one-on-one. -on -one. I study with my Rav, and uh, aside from that, I study on my own. And aside from that, I study with the public. And doing these shulim, I don't have the time to do one-on-one -on -one studies with people. Um, but uh, certainly you could learn everything that I'm learning uh, by watching my shulim. You could watch my shulim. You could watch many of them. There's Baruch Hashem, thousands of them. And if you truly want to learn with me, then you learn all the lectures. You learn them and not learn them as watching them like it's a show. Learn them by actually writing down notes, looking even deeper into the sources that I mentioned, and uh, collecting them with notebooks, off the notebooks, just like I do with my Rav for all these years. And uh, you can learn an enormous amount of Torah with me by watching all the lectures. And if you have questions, you send questions. You can either send questions to the AI rabbi, that is in essence taking the, all the database of all the lectures that I've ever done with Baruch Hashem, many sources and many books, and also Rabbi Freim's lectures were, are, are added right now also, all of this information and books are in this database. You could ask your questions and you'll get the answer. Uh, and uh, you could even ask specific questions about the lectures that you're watching. Uh, and if you need uh, something else, you could also contact us uh, directly by sending a question to my WhatsApp and I'll answer the question the best that I can. It just uh, becomes more and more difficult to answer all the questions every day because there's a lot of them. So that's part of the reason and motivation of why we developed the AI Rabbi. Because it's, it's not just some uh, computer answering you. It's a computer that's based on a decade of teachings uh, alongside the books of the Torah. So you have the ideology, personality, and even the voice uh, as, you know, that's available to you. And uh, I, I highly recommend for people to, to use it. This is, uh, the people that have used it are saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. The, the feedback we're getting, even from, from a few Torah scholars that I know that are using it, they're like, listen, this is, uh, this is my best new study buddy. <laughs> so, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Can you eat halal meat? If you're not Jewish, you could eat halal meat as much as you want because the non-Jews are uh, not obligated to uh, follow the kashrut laws. You could eat halal meat, you could eat uh, non-halal meat. But if you're a Jew, you're only allowed to eat kosher meat. And halal meat is not considered kosher. Their, uh, their uh, slaughter is uh, different, their ways are different. and In fact, you'll typically see that... Uh, Almost every Jewish butcher that has a, that sells meat to the public is within a vicinity, sometimes even next door to a halal meat store. And the reason for that is because everything that the uh, that the butcher you know slaughters and uh, and is it ends up not being kosher because there's something in the lungs or uh, that's not acceptable according to Jewish law. They sell to the Arabs because the the Arab law allows them to eat what we're not allowed to eat. So for example, if there is srichot, if there's, there's something with the lungs, that's not uh, poisonous or anything like that. It's just, uh, it's not acceptable according to the Torah law. So therefore we can't eat it. We sell it to the Arabs, you know, because the Arabs are allowed to, the Muslims are allowed to eat kosher meat. Uh, kosher meat is considered halal for them, but halal is not considered kosher. So many times, uh, there is a uh, ongoing relationship between the... Uh, the Jewish butchers and uh, the, uh, the the Muslim market, where we sell them what, whatever we can eat. All the taref we sell to them, but uh, to them it's it's not taref. To them it's halal. It's okay.
So you're asking another. Why can't you eat halal meat? What's the reason? I just said it's not considered kosher. For example, when you slaughter a uh, uh, when you slaughter a uh, cow. For for a Jew, you have to slaughter it in such a fashion that uh, it rips the one vein, or one uh, um, what is it called? One artery that 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 is connecting the the brain to everything else in a single shot. So that way, there's the the animal is instantly killed. In the the laws of of, of the Muslim laws, they don't have such a thing. So many times, they just chop the whole head off of the cow, uh, or they slaughter it in, in ways that are unacceptable to Jewish law. Uh, so, uh, in fact, if, if you compare the two, you see that the, uh, the uh, way of the Torah is much more humane. Now, that does not mean that it's fun to watch or it's pleasing to the cow to die, uh, but needless to say, it's a, it's a very different way of slaughtering. So, if somebody slaughtered a, uh, a cow uh, and uh, they made a mistake, not that they chopped the whole head off, but rather they cut the cow and they didn't get the whole vein, they didn't get enough of it, then even though they could do another, another push and they could die, it's taref. It's, you can't, the Jew can't eat it. A Jew can't eat it. It becomes non-kosher. The whole cow is not kosher. Now, for, for Muslim purposes, for Islam, there's no problem with it. They can eat it uh, and do what they want with it. But for Jewish purposes, not. Or even if they cut and they slaughter the cow and it's perfectly fine. The, the, the cutting was perfectly fine. Uh, but then they found out that there is a, uh, certain, a hole in the, uh, in the lungs you know, cows, uh, you know, all types of these, uh, these animals, they, you know, they eat all types of things on the ground, and sometimes they'll eat nails. And those nails, uh, you know, stay inside their body and can affect them. Now, if there's a hole in the lung, that even though the slaughter itself was perfectly fine, for the Jew, that cow is no longer kosher, because the lung has a hole in it. Or there's some type of hole, they find out that there was something within the cow that shows that that cow would not have survived for a full year. They had something, that some type of thing in it. Now, for, for Islam purposes, they don't care if it could have survived for one year or for one day. Once you kill it, you kill it. The end. Whether it has a nail or it has an uh, entire uh, garage inside the lung, it doesn't make a difference to, the, to, to Islam. To them, the only thing that's, uh, that's uh, critical is just simply slaughter the cow. But to us, we have many, many more laws. So therefore, it's a, uh, there's a big difference in, the, uh, in, in kosher meat uh, from halal meat. There's a big price difference and there's a lot of effort difference. Uh, another major thing is that uh, the knife, the knife is supposed to be constantly sharpened. So that means that if somebody has a, uh, the butcher's knife, has a, 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 a break in it of some kind, or has, uh, it's, it's not perfectly sharp, and somebody uses that knife to slaughter, even though the slaughter went fine, the cow died, the lungs are perfect, it's still not a kosher cow. It's still not kosher. Why? Because there was a problem with the knife. Now again, if this is done knowingly, the whole cow is not kosher. If it's accidental, then they rely on a lachic uh, 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 leniency based on quantity and, and other uh, circumstances. But the point is, is that there are many, many different laws that uh, are uh, required to follow in order to make a slaughter of a cow or chicken or whatever other kosher animal uh, to, to make it kosher. Whereas for Islam, it's, there's, in so many words, one law, uh, just a slaughter. Uh, now, as far as the, uh, the animals, that uh, also is, makes a difference. In Judaism, uh, you're only allowed to eat animals that have split hooves and they chew their cud. They have to have both of these signs. So if they only have one of those signs, like the pig, then you cannot uh, eat a pig because it only has one sign. If it has no sign, uh, then they can't eat the, uh, the animal. So in order for an animal to, have, to be kosher, they have to have two signs that the Torah says, which is split hooves and also has to chew its cud. So the typical animals that uh, Jews eat, uh, you have uh, uh, goats, uh, sheep, 
cows, those are the types of animals that we typically eat, but there's also, uh, you know, uh, other animals that are not eat often, but they also they are also kosher. Like even a zebra is kosher, not a zebra, a um, what do you call the, the the big thing? Not a zebra, the uh, giraffe. Giraffe, even a giraffe is kosher, but nobody eats giraffe. Uh, not only because uh, it's a uh, um, uh, not necessarily rare, but it's obviously rare in comparison to cows and and, and sheep, but also because the, uh, the 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 market for it is uh, doesn't really exist uh, and uh, doesn't pay doesn't pay to uh, to kill it. Uh, but uh, some people believed. I myself used to believe that it's different. To, it's difficult to slaughter a uh, um, a giraffe um, as far as finding the specific place uh, on it that uh, uh, that's kosher. But that's not true. It's actually relatively easy to find the place of where to slaughter it. It's just extremely difficult to actually slaughter the giraffe because it's so powerful. But needless to say, nobody eats giraffe today, even though it's a kosher animal. Um, but so there are animals that are kosher that are not eaten, uh, like deer, for example, is kosher, but it's rarely eaten, rarely eaten. Now, on the other hand, there are animals that are not kosher. So even if you slaughter them, it doesn't make a difference. You know, so there are specific types of animals when it comes to, uh, fish, fish do not need to be slaughtered. Uh, they, uh, you could eat them right out of the ocean. There's no problem. But they have to be kosher fish. In order for it to be a kosher fish, it has to have fins and scales. If it has fins and scales, then it's a kosher fish. But if it only has fins and no scales, then it's not a kosher fish. So a shark, for example, is not a kosher fish. Uh, you know. But on the other hand, if you have a, uh, a tuna, tuna is a kosher fish. Sartan uh, Lokasha, no, the uh, the um, shellfish is not uh, does not have neither fins nor scales, and they're actually considered bugs and they're considered uh, not kosher. Salmon is kosher, yes. Do I agree with what Israel is doing with Palestine? I've spoken about this many times. No, I don't agree with what Israel is doing with Palestine. I think that they need to be a lot more aggressive with them to remove them from the land completely, uh, just like the Torah says. And uh, that's it. That's that's it's that's what I agree with. I don't agree with uh, a two-state solution. I don't agree with them even having a a job in Israel. Uh, there's no uh, reason whatsoever why a terrorist enemy of the people needs to be uh, given rights and permission to live in the same land. That wouldn't be allowed in, in, in America. If somebody was known to be a terrorist in America, they wouldn't allow him to live here. But even if they want to live, allow him to live here, let him move to America, let him move to the UK, let him move to Gehenom for like here. Why live in Israel? The only reason why they want to live there is because they want to cause chaos. They want to kill people. I can't have that opinion. Why can't I have that opinion? That's the opinion of the Torah. The opinion of the Torah, uh, Hashem told us not to allow any of our enemies into, uh, to live in the land. Jewish people pray in synagogues. Where do you pray if there's no synagogue in a mosque or a church? Neither one. I'll pray at home. Why do I need to pray at a place? I don't have an obligation to pray in a synagogue. If I don't have a synagogue available to me, I pray at home. I could pray in the middle of the street. There's no reason whatsoever that any Jew should ever enter a mosque or a church. They're forbidden from entering a church because it's a place of idolatry. Uh, but a mosque is still a bad idea to enter because many of them are uh, terrorist uh, organizations uh, that are funding it or behind it. And unfortunately, 
Uh, you could be uh, praying right next to somebody that is more than happy to slaughter you 15 minutes later. Can you explain why meat and dairy can't be consumed at the same time? Because the Torah says it three times that uh, you're not allowed to eat meat and dairy, benefit from meat and dairy, cook meat and dairy. Meaning you cannot cook meat and dairy, you cannot eat meat and dairy, and you cannot benefit, like sell meat and dairy. It's three times in the Torah. Are you for wars? Absolutely. The wars of Hashem. The wars of Hashem are the wars of the Torah. As far as wars with people and wars with countries, as long as they leave us alone and they let us live in peace, no, there's absolutely no reason for us to go to war. We're not looking to conquer more land. We're not looking to take anybody's uh, property. We're not looking for uh, anyone to be, uh, you know, in, in, in our property. But uh, if it's a war for survival, then sure, you have to fight for survival. But if it's a, uh, uh, for, you know, gaining something, no. Do you know any Muslims in real life? Yeah, of course I do. I even have a few uh, friends that are uh, Muslims. I actually have some students that were former Muslims and converted to Judaism. I have some students that uh, are uh, former Muslims and did not convert to Judaism, but they abandoned Islam and uh, are following the Noahide laws of the Torah. And I even have a few uh, uh, friends that are you know, old colleagues of mine uh, that uh, still practice their religion, but they don't have the common belief of terrorism uh, that uh, the Muslims uh, preach in many places. They're normal, decent people. Uh, we obviously have an ideological difference as far as uh, uh, what's the truth and, and so on, but uh, we still have an amicable relationship and uh, there's, no, uh, there's no problem. I don't have a problem with somebody believing something different than I do. I have a problem if somebody's trying to make me believe what they say uh, in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a way that's uh, despicable like missionaries and uh, do in, 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 disguise, in disguising themselves as Jews, but really they're uh, preaching Christianity. That's the type of stuff that makes my skins crawl. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, Muslims, I don't have a problem with Muslim people per se. Uh, like I said, I have friends, uh, that have students, I, I, you know, I grew up in Israel for the first ten years of my life. My uh, my parents and uh, grandparents spoke Arabic in the house, uh, so uh, you know, with each other, with us, they spoke Hebrew. Uh, but uh, as far as um, as far as uh, Muslims, there's no, I don't have an issue with them. I have an issue with the people that are taking the parts of Islam uh, that uh, are said in the Quran. Or, or, or the Hadith uh, that are preaching anti-Semitism, that are preaching Jewish hatred, that are preaching things that uh, are um, leading people to become violent, to become terrorists, uh, to become uh, weapons of mass destruction. That I have a problem with. That I have a problem with. Uh, so it's not necessarily the people per se, it's the belief system. Now, if you're a Muslim that's a decent human being, and you choose to believe that Muhammad is your, uh, is your prophet, by all means, I believe you're wrong, and I know you're wrong, but you don't have to agree with me. But if you're a decent human being, we can still have coffee, we can still shake hands, we can still uh, talk about different neutral topics, no problem. Uh, but if you are either a physical terrorist or a spiritual terrorist, then you are my enemy. In fact, even if you're Jewish, and your parents are rabbis and rabbaniot, and you're a spiritual terrorist that's preaching heresy, you're also my enemy. Why? Anyone that's an enemy of Hashem or the Jewish people is also my enemy. That's what uh, David Amalek says. 
in Tehilim that we read in our prayer every single day. We read in our prayer where our Kadosh Baruch Hu, uh, loves David Melech, but David Melech says that whoever you hate, I hate. Whoever you hate, I hate. Whatever you hate, I hate. So a person that understands that uh, in order to be a lover of Hashem, you have to follow His Torah. Uh, and following His Torah means that you hate whatever Hashem hates. Then certainly, there's a, that, that shows you where the line is. And you can't go back past that line. You can't bend the line. That's where the line is. If you're an enemy of Hashem, or you're an enemy of the Jewish people, you're my enemy. Simple. So whether you're Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, or you're even an alien coming from the planet Pikachu, and you look really, really cute, and you're yellow, but you say things that are against the Torah, you are my enemy. Simple. But if you are not an enemy of the Torah, you're not an enemy of the Jewish people, certainly you could send a message, and I'll send you a response. When I get a chance, though. But don't send a long message, because then I'll probably skip it. <clears throat> Is it okay to kill someone in self-defense in Judaism? It's not only okay, it's an obligation. The Torah says, somebody comes to kill you, kill them first. Can Jews pray in a mosque? Like I said, you're allowed to pray in a mosque, you just shouldn't. It's a stupid thing to do. Number one, there's plenty of synagogues. And number two, with the way the world is right now and the extraordinary level of anti-Semitism, especially coming from that belief system, praying in a mosque is simply taunting the enemy. It's a stupid thing to do. You want to do stupid things, go ahead. Go do stupid things. You know, there's some people that jump out of a plane without a parachute. You want to be one of those stupid people? By all means, enjoy, enjoy. There's no, I don't have, I don't have any, uh, any stock in uh, in the uh, stupid.com. I don't have any stock in that. I invest in smart.com. Smart? What's smart? Torah is smart. Can you eat the what? Uh, there are parts of the cow, yes, that even if it's kosher, you can't eat the entire cow. There's the gida nashe, uh, that uh, in essence, almost the, the back part of the cow you can't eat. But the rest of the cow you can. If you just a, uh, type on the internet, on Google, what are the kosher parts of, uh, of the cow, you'll see a thousand pictures uh, of uh, cows with like a uh, like squaring off the parts that are kosher and uh, you know like having like a digital uh, line showing you where the parts are kosher and what parts are not kosher you'll get it in two seconds just put right on the internet on google or somewhere else what are the kosher parts of the cow we love to be your enemies in the street Sure, you could be an enemy in the street. You could be a, a rat, for all I care. doesn't make a difference to me. Um, whether you're an enemy in the street or you're an enemy on the internet, because I have no problem with you being my enemy. Rami, you're a Kurdish Jew. You guys have overcome some major obstacles in the last 30 years. Baruch Hashem. There's actually a uh, couple of books that I uh, read about the, uh, what happened in, uh, in, in that part of the world. And there was actually uh, many uh, uh, American Jews that uh, made trips to Kurdistan and uh, different parts of, uh, of, of, of Russia to uh, literally infiltrate the community to bring in Judaism and uh, Hashem, there's been great results uh, where many Jews as a result ended up coming to America, to Israel, to different parts of the world and joining the rest of the Jewish world so Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Uh, the Kurdish people that I know are very very warm people, wonderful people 
Uh, beautiful Jews, Baruch Hashem. See. Okay, let's see if uh, Facebook has anything st smart to say. Uh, what are the tikkunim for intentional pekel abrit? Uh, you go to uh, tikkun abrit dot live. Over there, there is an explanation um, of the the uh, tikkunim that uh, the whole concept of tikkun abrit. Each intentional wasting seed is eighty four fasts. Now, since the average person will not be able to do even one tikkun for one sin. Needless to say, for many sins they did for years, uh, the way that uh, the Chachamim say to do tikkun for tikkun abrit is with money. So on that site, tikkun abrit that live, not only you can get educated uh, about tikkun abrit, but you could also do the tikkun. You could donate for the sake of tikkun abrit. It tells you exactly uh, how to calculate it, uh, and you can do as many tikkunim as often as you would like. You could do it once. You could do it once a month, once a week. Uh, We've had people do it, uh, you know, uh, once uh, uh, one time. We've had people that signed up for once a month or a couple times a month. We've had even a couple of people that have done it. Uh, I think the biggest one we had probably someone do it like a couple of hundred or two hundred times at once. Um, so you know, it depends. Depends how much how much you want to do tshuva. It depends what your 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 financial means are. But it's certainly a good thing to do. Every guy that has, or girl that has the financial means to do a tikkun for immorality, you should go to that website, tikkunabrit.live, and do as many tikkunim as you can. Uh, and if you can't do a lot at once, you should at the very least sign up to do once a month a uh, tikkun. There's also tikkun goya, tikkun uh, other things, but that's the main thing. If a person wants to give more regularly, but... Other, the other wants to pay down debt. What is the best course of action? Uh, well, it all depends. And, you know, if you're able to service the debt, um, then uh, certainly uh, it's better to to give more because you're not promised tomorrow. A person can pay off their uh, entire house, you know, 15 years early. Let's say instead of having a 30-year uh, mortgage for 30 years, they'll pay double the mortgage and they'll finish their mortgage in 15 years, thinking that uh, they won't have a mortgage payment in uh, after 15 years so they can live, uh, you know, the rest of their life, uh, you know, while having a mortgage payment. But who told you you're going to live a long life? Who said you're going to live uh, 30 years even to finish the mortgage? So certainly a person should do the most they possibly can to, uh, to invest into Torah and to help the the, uh, the the world of Torah to help Kiruv now rather than later. This doesn't mean that a person should ignore their debt or their obligations. They should still serve their debt. They should still serve their their, their obligations. Uh, but I wouldn't uh, necessarily uh, be uh, so um, set on paying off all my debt so uh, I could be financially free. Because that plan never works. That plan never works. Uh, it's a... Uh, once a person pays off all their debt, they feel good for a few minutes. A couple of months later, they start developing new debt all over again. It's the way it is. The way to uh, pay down, uh, uh, the way to, 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 to grow is not necessarily uh, to, to pay down debt. It's obviously to have a reasonable amount of debt, not to get overboard, not to be an overspender. But really, the, the, the biggest winning strategy is to find a way to make more. Make more with your time, make more with your money, make more with your skills. Um, having debt is not necessarily uh, a bad thing. In fact, if you are going to grow in, uh, in the world of investments, in the world of uh, entrepreneurism, in the world of business, debt is required. Uh, you know, so, uh, so I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a purpose to it. I actually have intentional debt. That even though I don't want, I don't, you know, Baruch Hashem, you know, after everything changed, 
And uh, we had to rebuild everything from scratch. Rebuilding, you know, rebuilding credit and everything took a while. But I choose to carry certain debt on purpose to to build the debt, to build the uh, to build the credit. And you know, but I, my strategy is to pay it off, and you know, to to, to never really, uh, uh, you know, to pay the full balances on certain cards or to uh, to to carry a balance on other ones. But the point being is, is that it's it's not because I need it for the sake of. Uh, affording something that I can't really afford, but rather for a different purpose. But, uh, you know, so, so, so debt is not necessarily automatically a bad thing. You could use debt for many, many different reasons um, in a positive way. Uh, but as far as the idea of, uh, of paying off all your debts, you have uh, uh, peace of mind, that's a very young idea. And by young, I mean it's an immature idea. It's an idea that young people have, uh, thinking that... Uh, the only way they'll have peace of mind is if they have no debt. It's, it's, uh, people, um, you know, believe these things because they were told on some podcast or some TV show. That's not really true. There's a benefit to debt. Again, as long as it's within reasonable levels. I'm not telling you guys to go take your credit card, max it out tomorrow on buying t-shirts. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, we'll take maybe one or two more questions and we're finished. Uh. Can you make me admin so I can block the hate comments? I honestly don't even know how to do that. Uh, but don't worry about them. All the people that say stupid things, it's, it's, it's good that they do it. There's two reasons. There's a few reasons why it's good that they do it. Number one, if they're cursing me and they're insulting me and or they're insulting the Torah or anything like that, or they're insulting the Jewish people or they're anti-Semitic, then it's better for them to be here instead of actually doing it to other people because other people will be offended by it, other people will be hurt by it. Uh, for, for me, it's, it's, it's completely irrelevant to me. They don't exist. So that's one. Other than just being a little annoying that they, it takes a little while to get to the final to the question because I have to keep scrolling, other than that, it doesn't make a difference. So it's better for them to be here and waste their life here, making hate comments here, rather than doing it in real life. That's number one. Two, the more they insult me or the Torah, uh, the better because that means that they're increasing their cup of sins much, much higher than they even know what, what it means. And that means that the punishment will come to them sooner. So a Kadosh Baruch Hu could destroy them sooner rather than later. I mean, isn't that what we all want? All of these terrorists to be out of the world? So this is what we're doing right now. We are actively allowing all of the free Palestine people to come to our channel to make all of the hateful remarks they want to make because our goal is to free Palestine. Only difference is it has a different meaning to us. Our free Palestine means we're going to free the world from that ideology by allowing them to make all the sins they want so HaKadosh Baruch could free us from them as soon as possible. Free Palestine. Go. Comment away, guys. Comment away. And uh, be the uh, internet terrorist that you want to be. At least don't become, don't do the same terrorism you do in real life. What if no one will pay your debts when you die? Okay, nobody will pay your debts. What's the problem? You have an estate. Once a person dies, they have an estate. And the debts are taken uh, from your estate. So if, let's say, for example, you have a house and you owe uh, $100,000 on the house, then the bank is going to want somebody to pay that $100,000. If nobody is there to pay the $100,000, they're going to foreclose on the house, force the house to be sold, and take their $100,000, and the, other, the rest of the money goes to the estate whether it's handled by the kids or something else, or whoever's a, the, 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 uh, uh, the beneficiary of your estate.
Does reciting Tikkun Kali for intentional Pekam Ablit even help a little bit while feeling guilt? Uh, certainly reading Tehilim in general helps. Everything. It's always good to read Tehilim. Tikkun Kali is just certainly uh, is, is a, uh, several chapters of Tehilim, of Psalms. You could read it every day. You could read it whenever you want. It's always good. It's always good to read Tehilim. Uh, as far as will it erase sins? No. Reading Tehilim does not erase sins. It helps, you know, inspire the soul to want to do uh, tshuva by stopping the sin, by not going back to the sin, and things like that. But it, it doesn't erase sins. That's not that's not the role of Tehilim. Okay, guys, thank you very much for learning. I appreciate it that we learned together. I hope that everyone takes everything to heart, to do tshuva, to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to really uh, push ourselves to the maximum, to become a, be- a, a, a beneficiary, a, a, a benefactor of the, of the public, whether it's with the gifts and talents or the gifts of money or skill, whatever it is, a person that wants life has to choose the perfect solution that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us, which is to help other people really acquire life, which means to get closer to Him. By being a benefactor of the public, you're certainly choosing life. Anyone that wants to donate and support can go to bhrh.org or bhyk.org or you could just go to a regular website, bezlatashem.org or bhtorah.org. We have many websites, Baruch Hashem. You could also uh, become a paid subscriber on uh, YouTube. And if you send us the proof of your uh, subscription, of paid subscription to events at bhtorah.org, we'll send you one of these cool tumblers to wherever you are, whether it's in South Africa or it's in New York, wherever you are, we send to Baruch Hashem. Uh, and last but not least, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the new AI Rabbi, and Shana Tova, and Bezat Hashem, we will learn again next year. Kol tu b'cha b'atzlacha. Rabotei Yekarim, Bezat Hashem, this message finds you doing well and preparing for the big holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. If you've learned Torah with us over the past decade, you've also learned that we hate lies, empty promises, and any statement without a source. So this year, we asked dozens of our donors to tell you themselves what they have received as a result of partnering with us and having us pray for them during this time of the year. And the conclusion you'll see, our donors receive miracles. Cured from cancer, having a child after 10 years of marriage without kids, financial success and protection in impossible situations, finding a zivug, special siyata dishmaya in Torah learning, and countless other miracles that you could read and watch these special neshamot tell you themselves. After a decade of nearly 14,000 shurei Torah, feeding hundreds of thousands of poor Jews, widows, and orphans in Eretz Yisrael, distributing nearly a quarter million books and two million USBs, CDs, and posters for free, setting up multiple kolos, Hashem has decided to continuously accept our prayers and blessings to help our donors get miracles. And this Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we want even more of you to get your personalized blessings and miracles. By donating generously and becoming our partner, you'll have the opportunity to help us feed 10,000 poor Jews this holiday, be a partner in nearly 1,000 Avrichim learning the entire Shas in a single day, and even get a special blessing with your name in one of our new books coming out this year. Rabotai, our donors receive unbelievable miracles. Join us by donating and getting others to donate. And Be'ezrat Hashem, you too will receive and be part of the next miracle story.